So, the average Amiga user only had a floppy drive that could read double density disks. And unlike the 720 kilobytes you could store on them if you were using a PC, the standard Amiga disk had a capacity of 880k. But then, a new format appeared called Disk Spare, and it was heavily used by Amiga User International magazine cover disks. In this video, we're going to take a look at how Disk Spare worked and why it was able to store so much more data. I've got a few Amiga User International cover disks here, and slightly off topic, you'll notice this one is a little bit different. The label looks rather nasty. Well, believe it or not, when I received this on the magazine, I noticed the label had been stuck on top of another, and I was curious to see what it was. So I peeled it off. And as you can see, behind it was a Ball and Paradox label. I wonder how that ended up happening. Now, I know it looks like I did that, but honestly, that's how it arrived. If anyone else had anything like this happen, please leave a message in the comments below. Anyway, Amiga User International, or AUI, used the disk bare format to squeeze more stuff onto their so-called super disks without including extra disks with the magazine. I'm guessing it was probably a cost-saving exercise whilst providing more value. But how did that work? Well, first we need to understand a little bit about floppy disk geometry. So, we'll start with a PC floppy disk. These double density disks, when formatted, allow you to store up to 720 kilobytes of data, ignoring what the actual file system takes up. Now, without going too deep into the weeds, I'll try and explain how. Firstly, a floppy disk, as I'm sure you're aware, is broken down into a series of rings or tracks. And there's a lot more than I've drawn there. Depending on terminology, they can sometimes be called cylinders, and I'm not going to go into the difference, so for simplicity, we'll stick with the word tracks. A normal disk is formatted with 80 tracks on each side, 0 to 79. Some drives allow you to write a few extra tracks beyond 80, but we'll come back to that later on. Now looking at these tracks, they're all broken up into smaller chunks, which we'll loosely call sectors. And a double density PC disk has 9 sectors per track, each one typically storing 512 bytes of data. This area here is called the sector gap, and it is literally the space between the end and the start of each track. Nothing is usually stored here, and it allows for small differences between disk spin speeds. It doesn't take too much maths to see where the 720k comes from. It's 80 tracks multiplied by two sides, multiplied by nine sectors, multiplied by 512, which gives you 737,280 bytes. And if you divide that by 1024, you get exactly 720k. But there's not just your data on the disk. There's information to actually locate each sector, so each sector is preceded by a sector header. For a PC disk, ignoring the encoding used, this is typically 8 bytes in size and contains information about which sector it is, along with some checksum information. There's other bytes around the header too, such as different sync words that identify different kinds of information following it, for example, if it's a header or the data. But the PC, for historical reasons, was a little bit wasteful with the way it used the disk. But before I explain that, you need to be aware of the index signal. It's an actual electrical signal that is sent once per revolution of the disk at exactly the same position on every single drive. I think on this picture it's around here. And by timing how long it's been since the rotation started, the position of each sector could be roughly located. Now because each drive spins at a slightly different speed, and you might be reading a disk that was also written at a slightly different speed, a certain amount of tolerance was needed to help locate the sectors. And that's what these gaps are for, as well as allowing a small amount of space in case, for example, your drives span a little bit faster, so it took less time to write the same amount of data. This gave it space to expand into without damaging the next sector. This has the advantage that only a single sector needs to be written if it changes, which also might make it faster. So that's the PC disk done. What about the standard Amiga disk? Well, it's much the same, except instead of 9 sectors per track, the Amiga manages to squeeze another 2, making it a total of 11. And from Workbench 2.0 onwards, it supported two different file systems, the original OFS and the newer Fast File System, or FFS. Yes, that's what FFS stands for and not what you were thinking. The major difference from our point of view is their capacity. The original file system stored 488 bytes per sector, whereas FFS stored 512 bytes. Each sector had a header in front of it which was 28 bytes long. Ignoring the header for a minute and doing the maths, this time you can see that we can now store around 838k on an OFS disk and 880k on an FFS formatted disk. Yes, they're different! If you don't believe me, you can see it here in this workbench screenshot. 
And yes, I know they're both 2k short of the calculation and that's because two of the blocks are reserved for the boot block and the rest are being used by the file system. So how does the Amiga squeeze that much data onto the disk? Well, the Amiga does this by packing all of the sectors together without spaces and writing the entire track in one go, meaning there's more space for extra data. The Amiga then relies on markers in the data to find the sectors rather than the index signal. This does mean, however, the Amiga must rewrite the entire track every single time a sector changes, but it doesn't bother with the index alignment. This formatted disk made a rather cool pattern, although once you've written to the disk a few times it starts to look a little bit more jumbled up. Now the Atari ST used a disk format almost identical to the PC, based on the FAT12 file system, except it didn't have the same strict timing requirements and gaps between sectors. This is why PC discs could be read on the ST, but ST formatted discs wouldn't read on a PC. Now it's important to remember this as we'll come back to ST discs later on. Looking at these sectors, we're really only interested in their amount and their size, because on top of these sits the file system itself which takes up some space too. So onward to disk spare, created by Claus Dipish, which allows you to store a lot more. So how did it do that? Well. It did this by squeezing 12 sectors per track instead of 11. If we make some assumptions about the floppy drive, and these being if the drive was absolutely perfect, we could store 6,250 bytes per rotation. That's obviously after it's been decoded. Most drives are usually within 1% of the spin speed. If we look at a single track, a PC disc would look something like this, and an Amiga disc would look something more like this. And you can see here, that there's not enough space for any more sectors. So what Disk Spare does is to use a different sector header. So instead of being 28 bytes long, it becomes just four, storing just the sector number, the track number, and two bytes for the checksum, which leaves the track looking like this. And it doesn't leave a lot of extra space on the end. So the drive would need to be spinning at the correct speed for this to work. Now I've never had any issues with data fitting, so I guess the calibration of the spin speed was very accurate with the Amiga floppy drives, which is good. However, I suspect Amiga User International was being a little bit cautious here. This is an image of a disk I formatted using Disk Spare, and using a few tricks I've got it all indexed aligned to make it easier to see. And there really isn't much room left there. In fact, I did struggle a little to make it fit, and I suspect that my drive's spinning a little bit fast. This is an image of the Amiga User International disk, and you'll notice the gap here is really big, yet it still has the full 12 sectors, although they aren't super obvious here. The way they did this was to steal a little bit of a trick from copy protection, and each track is essentially written as a long track, meaning the data is actually slightly sped up, but still within the tolerance of the drive, so therefore taking up less space. I suspect they did this to make sure the disk duplicators they had didn't have any issues to actually trying to fit all the data. But there's more to this! Firstly, Amiga drives could actually use track 80 and 81 most of the time. So, making changes to the disk spare mount list file and reformatting the disk, we're now able to store 984k of data on a floppy disk. That's crazy when you compare it to the PC. Now, I wonder if I was to push this a little bit further, could I fit an extra sector? Hmm. The Amiga wasn't the only system to try this. The ST also had a few tricks up its sleeves, and not restricted in the same way as the PC, was able to store 11 sectors per track by shortening all the gaps. And also, some Atari ST drives could actually write up to track 83, and so in total, a formatted disk could have a capacity of 924k. Now Disk Spare is a really interesting format, and there were a few others too. I never had any issues with it, but I wonder if others did given how close to the tolerance of the drive the data actually was. The reason I've been messing with Disk Spare is I've been adding support for it into Disk Flashback. This update won't be out for a while, but it should be helpful when it is. Anyway, I hope you found this interesting, thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.